Hello, everybody. How are you doing today? It's Dr. Kelly of Discovery Health. I am so happy that you're here. Thanks for always joining me. As always, I want to remind you to like my videos. The more likes I get, the more shares I get, the more people I can reach. And tonight, we are going to talk about why breakfast is not the most important meal of the day and why you may want to consider intermittent fasting. So some of you I know have heard of intermittent fasting before. A friend of mine and someone who routinely watches my Facebook Lives and uh, works with people as well to get them healthier asked me to talk a little bit about intermittent fasting and some of its benefits. So I decided to write something up to talk to you tonight. And as I was talking everything through my head, I thought, gosh, everybody thinks that Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. I know that you were taught that breakfast is the most important meal of the day, but you were taught wrong. Honestly, the majority of things that you have been taught through your whole life, at least about foods and about nutrition and about being healthy, is wrong. And if you've listened to any of my videos before, you're kind of getting that theme that I'm telling you some things that you've never heard of before. And it's not that they are crazy. I am not the crazy doctor. I am, you know, not the charlatan. I am just talking about how the body works. So the sacred cow that breakfast is the most important meal of the day was really brought more to you because of selling more breakfast foods than anything else. Your body does not need to eat as soon as you wake up. In fact, I'm going to tell you as we go on that most of the time people aren't even hungry when they first wake up. So I want you to think about breakfast and what most people eat for breakfast or what you're feeding your kids or your grandkids for breakfast, and then um, what are the most typical uh, foods in America? Hello, Sherry, for breakfast. Well, it's, hi, Mandy, it's cereal, right? Cereal, cereal, cereal. Pancakes, waffles um, with sugar and with, um, uh, hi, Jojo, with, hi, Mary Kay, um, syrup, that's the word I'm looking for. I can't apparently read and talk at the same time. Sorry about that. But so think about breakfast. And it may not be your typical breakfast, but think about what most people eat. Think about the most common or the most popular uh, breakfast cereal bars, right? Okay, great. The Nutrigrain bar. I, I, my, we're in such a hurry. My kids grab a Nutrigrain bar and off to school they go, right? So have you ever read the ingredients of a Nutrigrain bar? If you haven't, I encourage you to go get it out of the cupboard and look at the ingredients. Go, next time you're in the grocery store, read the ingredients. And this is the same thing for all of those pancake mixes out there, for all of those um, waffles and things like that. Grains, 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 carbs, 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 and sugar. All you're doing is feeding your kids sugar. All you're doing is eating sugar. What happens with sugar? We spike our blood sugar and we crash. So we feel like we got to eat again and we spike and we crash and we spike and we crash. Okay. Hi, Diet. Awesome, Diet. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. So if you take a, a good look at those Nutrigrain bars, you're going to see in the first five ingredients that four of them are sugars. And you know that by reading ingredients that the first list is the the highest quantity. And the last thing on the list of ingredients is the smallest amount of quantity. So there's a whole bunch of dyes. There's a whole bunch of sugar, high fructose corn syrup. All it is, the most popular breakfast bar out there where you think that you're giving somebody something nutritious, all it is is sugar. And you're sending your kids off to school or you're heading to work on sugar, which results in mental crashes, irritability, constant hunger, and cravings and cravings and cravings. This is why breakfast is not the most important meal of the day, because the majority of people are eating crap, bunch of carbs, and a bunch of sugar. So 
There's a really interesting fact as we start to talk about um, intermittent fasting that before the 1970s, when the obesity rates were actually pretty low, most people did a daily 12-hour fast. And this was considered normal eating. It was typical to have two, maybe three meals a day, but people ate from 7 in the morning till 7 in the evening. So they had a 12-hour window of eating, and they had a 12-hour window of not eating. So you went to bed. When you got up in the morning, maybe after your chores were done, you would break the fast. Did you ever wonder where the word breakfast comes from? You break the fast. So you stopped eating at 7 p.m. You got up in the morning. You did whatever you needed to do. You ate maybe around 7 o'clock in the morning, and you broke that 12-hour window of the fast. That's where the word breakfast comes from. So that was very typical before the 1970s. That was the routine. People did it all the time. You had a long period of time where your body was without food, your blood sugar stabilized, your insulin was nice and low, and you stopped beating up your body. We were much healthier back then. This routine actually changed uh, in the late 1970s, around 1977, when the USDA created this dietary guideline for Americans, and we've gone downhill ever since. You were taught from these guidelines to eat high carbohydrates and low fat. So the theory was that fat made you sick and you needed to eat more carbs. But ever since that time, obesity has skyrocketed. Type 2, um, it's actually just eating all of those carbs has created the problems that we see and know today with obesity, type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, all of which lead to chronic illness. Do you ever wonder why so many people are so sick? It's because of how they've been eating, what they were taught since the 1970s of carbs, carbs, and carbs. And of course, the food makers advertise like crazy. There's tons and tons of money in their advertising to buy that Nutrigrain product. And I apologize that I'm only using Nutrigrain. There are many other bad products out there that are just sugar, 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 and carbs. At that same time, um, something else changed. You know, before, during that 12-hour fast, they were eating two, maybe three meals a day. But since the late 1970s, we decided with this new guideline that we needed to eat more often. So three meals a day for sure, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And well, gosh, it's such a long period of time between breakfast and lunch. And in such a big period of time between lunch and dinner. And then, well, my goodness, you're going to be starving if you don't eat anything after dinner. So you've got to have a snack. So eat breakfast, have a snack, have lunch, have a snack, eat supper, have a snack, and then go to bed. And you wonder why we're sick and fat. My goodness, more meals with all of those snacks, increasing the glucose level, the blood sugar level, right, which increases the demand of insulin, and that hormone, insulin, is super, super powerful. We've talked about this before. Sugar makes you fat. Look for that video if you haven't seen that video yet. But the sugar makes your blood sugar go up, which makes your body make more insulin, and the insulin makes you fat because it makes you store more fat. So this constant insulin in your bloodstream makes you fat, makes you gain a fat cell. Then it makes you more hungry because remember what I started with? Well, your blood sugar and your, your blood sugar goes up, so your insulin has to get that, that glucose into the cell and you drop. And then you're hungry and you're crabby and you're craving things. And so you eat again those carbs and you just had your snack and you spike and then you drop down. Oh my gosh, well, I'm hungry and I'm craving. And so you eat and you spike and this is what you do all day long. And so it drives you. It's a horrible, vicious cycle and you will never be healthy if you keep eating like that. So, here comes intermittent fasting. So all it means is that you only eat for a certain period of time, right? Intermittent fasting is a great way to break that vicious cycle.
Okay? So it's a period of time when you don't eat. That's it. We all fast every night when we go to bed, unless you're a sleepwalker and you get up and you eat in the middle of the night. Most of us fast for 8 hours, 10 hours, maybe 12 hours, and we're going to talk more about what intermittent fasting, um, ways to do intermittent fasting, but the basic concept is stop eating all of the time. That's it. You're going to give your body a break and it's going to help your body heal and repair. So there is no right way or wrong way to do intermittent fasting. In fact, there's a lot of different ways. Nathan here says, I've been 18 hour fasting most days for months now and have never felt better. Awesome job, Nathan. Awesome job. So everybody is always afraid to fast. And I know I've talked about that a little bit before, but most people, when I encourage them to do it, either to do some intermittent fasting or to do a 24-hour fast or a 48-hour fast, and there are much longer fasts as well, and you're not going to die, you're not going to starve, and your body's metabolism is not going to shut down by doing fasting. There are too many wonderful properties it stimulates your body to do. But all we're talking about tonight is the intermittent fasting, okay? And there is no right way to do it or wrong way to do it. You can't screw it up, okay? All you have to do is try. So some people will find that they like to eat in only a four-hour window. Other people will eat for a six-hour window, or maybe it's an eight- or ten-hour window. It doesn't matter. I'll tell you that most of the time myself, I do a... Um, uh, I usually don't eat in the morning till around 10 or 11. So I typically fast from 7 p.m. until 11 o'clock the next morning. And so it's a 16 hour fast um, and then an eight hour time frame that I can eat. And maybe some days, you know, I'm not hungry when I wake up in the morning, so I don't eat. I do have some coffee probably two hours after I get up. And then, you know, if I'm hungry by 10, I'll eat at 10. I don't have to not eat until 11. If I'm hungry at 10, I'll eat at 10. If I'm hungry at 9, I'll eat at 9. But then I still typically just follow that eight-hour window and try not to eat late at night. Okay, so it can be variable. So I typically do a 16-hour fast, but there was a period of time, there were a couple of weeks where I was doing a 20-hour fast, and I felt fantastic. I really felt great. My energy was a lot higher, and there are different things that go on in our lives, different things that... Um, you know, make you different events, um, you know, some other things going on for some reason that I didn't stick with only eating in that four hour window and I went back to the eight hour. But now since somebody asked me to talk about it, I remember how good that I felt and my appetite actually went down. I was less hungry then than I am now doing an eight hour window only. So there are tons of great benefits which I'm going to tell you about next, but the key thing is to know that you can do it however it works in your lifestyle, okay? It's super easy to build in intermittent fasting around any lifestyle, and especially for those of you who have kids who are doing a lot of events and sporting events, it would be great if you were fasting when you were at the ballpark or at the volleyball game or at the basketball game because you don't want to be eating out of the concession stand. You know, you are not choosing healthy food when you're eating out of the concession stand. So just a thought. Um, okay, so what are the benefits of intermittent fasting? Now, I'm going to give you a list, actually, that is just out of a book that I use as a reference, The Complete Guide to Fasting by Jason Fung, who is a medical doctor, and Jimmy Moore also has some content in there. Hi, Bev. Hi, Andrea. So in his book, Dr. Fung's book of The Complete Guide to Fasting, it's a great resource. He lists these 10 benefits of intermittent fasting. It improves, or fasting in general, I should say, improves mental clarity and concentration. 
induces weight and body fat loss, so you can lose weight. Some people want to do intermittent fasting so they can lose weight. That's some of the reason why it's a strategy, it's a tool that I use with some people that I work with. It can lower your blood sugar levels. It improves insulin sensitivity. It increases your energy. It stabilizes or lowers your blood cholesterol. It helps to prevent diseases like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. It actually extends your life. It can reverse the aging process, help you look younger. Hey, Penny. And it also decreases inflammation. How great are all of those things? And the majority of those things all result from that lowered level of insulin in the bloodstream. That hormone, insulin, changes everything and it allows human growth hormone to increase a little bit. Now, some people know of the human growth hormone diet. Remember people that diets don't work. You need to have a lifestyle of good habits. Hey, Tony. And intermittent fasting is one strategy or one tool that can help you with not what you eat, but the when you eat. Giving your body a break from food brings down the insulin levels. That insulin, that high glucose, that sugar, and all three of those things that I just mentioned are one in the same in the fact that they cause disease they cause inflammation. So when you start to control the when you eat, you're controlling how much your body is being insulted every single day all the time. Hello, Melissa, from food, even when it might be nutritious food, okay? I know that that can be kind of confusing, but the bottom line with those 10 things that I mentioned, that intermittent fasting or 24-hour, 48-hour fasting, is so beneficial to your body because it stabilizes the blood sugar, it decreases the insulin. That hormone insulin is what's creating inflammation and is what is fogging up the brain with all of that glucose and um, making you age faster than you should. So when the insulin levels in the body begin to run lower, it's the key change to help you lose weight to decrease inflammation, which results in decreased pain. It increases human growth hormone. Human growth hormone helps you to burn fat. And it triggers the cells to repair. Okay, so I'm going to repeat that because it's really kind of important. So that human growth hormone and the control of the insulin triggers the cells to repair the body. Now remember, we talk about this all the time too, that the body can heal itself. Every time you get a cut, okay, every time you get a scratch, your body creates that scab, it heals it underneath, the scab comes off, and wow, your skin is all healed. Your body healed itself. We just have to get out of the way and we have to give it the opportunity to heal itself. The best healing time is at night, while we sleep, when we're fasting. Hmm, think that's all a coincidence? Between that 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. is the time when your body is healing the most. So when you do some intermittent fasting, you're giving your body a longer period of time for healing and repair for decreased inflammation. So all of those things help to reverse disease and extend your life. So I encourage you to consider starting to do some intermittent fasting. When you know that you can eat that day, doing a little bit longer period of time fasting is really not that hard. If you review, and I'm going to have this on my Discovery Health Lifestyle page. I'm going to write it up as a blog. I'll put the, the video there with the written information too. But all of those great benefits for brain clarity, increased energy, weight loss, etc., if you start to do some intermittent fasting, just that um, fasting for 16 hours a day, eating for only 8 hours a day, over time, you're going to lose weight without even trying. 
just by eating within that time frame. And that's pretty cool. So when I work with somebody, depending, you know, is their goal weight loss? Is their goal energy? You know, do they need hormone balancing? We need to heal the gut. Whatever the issues might be, we start with um, eating better. Then we work on healing the gut. We get rid of the food allergens. And through that process, they're decreasing inflammation. They're feeling better. We go through a detox process. Maybe they lost a little bit more weight. Everything's going well. I'm right where I'm supposed to be. Everything feels good, but I still want to lose 10 pounds. I still want to lose 25 pounds, whatever it might be. I want them then to have created a good lifestyle, good habits, a good eating pattern, but then we'll add on the intermittent fasting because they know how to eat. Now we're going to work on the when to eat. And if they continue that over time, you know, a month went by, two months went by, wow, I lost five pounds and I didn't even try anything. So it's a great way, especially since we're coming into winter, where we get a little more sedentary. We're not doing as many activities outside because obviously the more active we are, the more calories we can burn, but I never want anybody counting calories. Um, but intermittent fasting is a great way to keep your weight under control through the winter, and it's a great way to continue to lose weight. Not super fast, but you also don't have to try real hard either. So, all right, guys, that's all I really wanted to talk about. Um, I was looking at sharing a bunch of myths, or we can talk more about, you know, 24-hour, 48-hour fasting. I've talked about juice fasting in the past, but tonight I just wanted to introduce you really to intermittent fasting. Super easy to do and um, has great, great benefits. If you're looking to lose weight, it's going to help you to do that, but it's not going to do it fast but it's gonna control your blood sugar and it's also gonna improve the insulin levels and the insulin sensitivity, which are key to your overall health. That chronic illness is caused by all of the carbs and all of the sugar that we eat that drives up the insulin. So you're welcome, Penny. I hope I answered your question. And um, anybody, if you have questions right now, please tell me. What do you want to know more about? What can I answer there for you? Um, Mary Kay tells me that she never liked breakfast. I used to be forced to eat it when I was little, and I still don't like it. Fantastic, Mary Kay. Now that you're an adult, you can choose. If you're not hungry, don't eat. That's the biggest thing that I can tell you, okay? So when you wake up in the morning and you're not feeling hungry, by all means, don't eat. If you're not hungry till noon, that's fine. You're only doing your body a good service. And then between noon and four or noon and six, eat some good, healthy food. You'll be giving your body plenty of nutrition. Diet says, I've never been hungry until I've been up for a couple of hours. Perfect. It makes the intermittent fasting that much easier. Nathan, I mentioned your comment already. And um, you're welcome, Mandy. You're very welcome. Does anybody have any other questions about intermittent fasting? Again, there is no right way or wrong way to do it. It depends on your schedule. So, um Great. Melissa's not a fan of breakfast either. I I think it's funny that um, the name of the first food that most people eat for the day was simply break the fast and it became breakfast. I think that's just really funny. And I think it's absolutely horrible that the majority of breakfast products are horrible for you. Full of dye, full of chemicals, full of sugar, and we wonder why we're sick. We're wonder, we wonder why our kids have a hard time paying attention and a hard time sitting still. Penny says, I work shifts. Can I flip flop my 16 hours of fasting and have it still be beneficial? Absolutely. Absolutely. Even, um, I mean, they've done studies, um, of fasting one day, eating the next, fasting, eating. So alternating. And don't eat gluten, Diet says. Perfect. Yay. Way to go. Um, so some people, or they did a study on people fasting every other day to evaluate their metabolism. Okay. And their metabolism didn't 
drop down. Like people who do the human growth hormone diet or restrict their calories severely to only 500 calories a day, that does put them into starvation mode or decrease their metabolism so that they burn fat very, very slowly because they went into, you know, barely giving their body enough um, every single day with only 500 calories. So Penny, to answer your question, just giving you a different type of example that works just fine. So when you work day shift, fast when it's most convenient. When you work night shift, fast when it's most convenient. Um, it's going to be perfectly fine no matter when you're doing that fasting. Just do it for whatever works for you for that routine. Hi, Virginia. What do you, th what do you drink during the fasting time? Well, water. Water, water, water will be your first thing. You can have some tea. You can have a coffee if you don't put a ton of crap in your coffee. So I put a little bit of MCT oil, and I do put a little bit of a coconut creamer in there, but that's all that I have during um, that fasting time. Now, um, some people who are very hardcore with fasting will say that's not a true fast, but there's many different ways to fast. And they've also looked at that and doing that coffee with just that little bit of a creamer doesn't stimulate the glucose and the insulin levels. So um, it, it tends to still give you all of the same benefits. So truly, a complete fast is nothing but water. But tea is not going to stimulate the insulin, and having one cup of coffee is not going to stimulate the insulin to get released. Now, if you wanted to do a 24-hour fast and you wanted to drink coffee all throughout it, that would be a bad idea because that's going to be very stressful on your body and stressful on your adrenal gland, and you don't want to do that. Caffeine can do that to you. But to have one cup during that time that you're fasting is fine. The most important thing is to make sure that you're getting in water and um, minerals with that water would be perfect too. So great question, Virginia. Um, anybody else? You're welcome, Penny. I hope that was helpful for you. So anybody else, if you have any other questions, now's your time. Oh, bone broth would be great too. Thanks, Penny. Bone broth um, is always fantastic. But again, make sure that it's actually just the broth. You're not, you don't want vegetables in there. This isn't, a, you know, a soup. It's just broth and that would be fine. It's going to give very little calories and going to be very healing for your gut as well. So that would be fine. All right, so good luck to you. Let me know if you have any problems, but everyone who listened to this video, please make sure that you share. I appreciate all of the likes. And then please try to do some intermittent fasting. Challenge yourself. You can do it. It's really not that hard. Even the people I asked to do a 24-hour fast, and we can talk about that another time, they're afraid of it at first, and then they do it, and they're like, well, that wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I used to be a person who felt like I needed to eat all of the time. I might get hypoglycemic when I would travel. I'd pack in my carry-on food because I was afraid I was going to be crashing. I used to get hypoglycemic episodes, but you know why? Because I used to eat like crap, and my sugars would always be spiking up. So then I'd be crashing and I'd need to eat. And then I'd spike up and I'd crash. So I had that blood sugar problem because of the way I was eating. And once you start to eat better, once you start to eat more fat, you sustain your glucose at low levels. You don't get insulin spikes. You don't have crashes. You don't have cravings. And you can handle not eating food for whatever period of time you choose. So thank you guys for listening tonight. I very much appreciate you being here and for your likes and for your shares. And I will talk to you again all really soon. Send me any questions that you have if you want me to talk about something. Good night.